heading out to Anahuac again, do some more flying. Uh, this past week, I got a uh, comment from one of the viewers that uh, he was asking, you know, about more about the machine. You know, uh, he wanted to know about the engine, the pre-rotator, the rotor, and, and whatnot. So, I'm going to take that opportunity to walk you guys through uh, my gyro, and maybe we'll go through a few other ones to show you the differences between some of these uh, these machines. Uh, being experimental, there's there's a lot of differences. You can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, stay within these, you know, you know, pretty broad guidelines that the FAA sit, sets. So as soon as we get out to the hangar, I'll walk you through my machine and uh, and uh, uh, you know maybe show you a few others, and then we'll go flying. All right, so as I said before, we're out here at the airport. You can see our hangars back there. Got my gyro here. It's a uh, started out as a just regular old air command back in uh, I think it was uh, originally built back in 1984, 1985. Uh, but uh, it's had a, a few slight modifications since then. I'll explain those as we go along. Here's our uh, very little airport out here. Wind sock barely moving, bright sun, not a cloud in the sky, but it is a little chilly. It's you know probably somewhere in the 40s, and for us down here in South Texas, kind of you know that's pretty damn cold. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, see where should I start here? Uh, like I said before, it's a uh, uh, air command. Uh, the original manufacturer of, of this kit was uh, up in uh, uh, kind of central, north central Texas, um, somewhere close to Waco, and um, and they they sold quite a few kits over the years, and this was uh, this has the centerline thrust uh, kit added to it. I believe originally this probably was the typical low boy machine and then uh, they bought a, an extra kit to to make it centerline thrust. So when I got it, it was bone stock and uh, had some 23 foot McCutcheon blades. They were uh, uh, a rotor. They were um, red in color. Um, they were in good shape, a little faded, you know, sun faded, but you know, they, otherwise they were good shape. But the engine that was in it when I got it was a 532 Rotax, uh, you know, straight out of a, I guess, a snowmobile, single ignition, um, and uh, it, it was uh, well, uh, don't you know, it wasn't quite out of a snowmobile. It, they put them in snowmobiles also, but mine probably was bought brand new uh, when the when the kit was bought. So the uh, when I got it, it had a, a 68 inch Ivo prop, uh, which worked well for for the gearing and the in the 65 horsepower Rotax that I had on there. The only problem was at the time I weighed, you know. 210, 215 with the center line thrust adds quite a bit more drag and I was having to pretty much fly full throttle the whole time and I wanted a little bit of a wiggle room there so I decided to uh, I, I found this EA82 Subaru EA82 that was on online uh, for sale and it was quite cheap um, and uh, it came out of a flying gyro. It's just the guy that had it had a, a full-bodied machine, and 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 uh, it was you know marginal. He wanted a little more power in his machine, so he bought something else, and he had this EA82 for sale. Well, the price was right, uh, even though research shows EA82 is you know it's kind of like the the in-between year bastard child of the Subarus. Uh, EA81 is a hell of a lot lighter and you could get pretty much the, about the same amount of horsepower out of it. Um, 
So that would have been a better choice, I would think. But, uh, you know, that's what I got. So, uh, it's approximately 95 horsepower. Uh, I don't, I don't know, you know, exactly, but you know, the numbers seem to, to, to work out right. Uh, I've added a um, couple of parts that came with the engine, had a couple of carbs, Weber, uh, 32, 36, um, a crane, uh, electronic ignition, uh, the distributor I, I changed out, you know, from the points to the electronic ignition, had to buy a new starter, had to buy this gearbox and uh, had to buy this prop. Now 68 IVO didn't work out very well with this gearing as I explained last week that the with this RPM and this gearbox the prop that I had just wasn't turning fast enough to produce the the thrust I needed to fly. So I uh, ended up uh, going ahead and changing the prop to a four blade 68 inch warp drive it's a lot stiffer it's got a little thicker cord and uh, that turned out to be very very nice I've got plenty of thrust now uh, I made the exhaust uh, this part was most of this was made by a friend of mine Keith or the the, the jug was and I did all the piping weld it all together you know I, I never claimed to be a welder but you know I, I can build a few things um, I did uh, have the heads rebuilt and uh, uh, they were uh, you know it wasn't really anything wrong I just wanted to you know have that peace of mind and and get them get them uh, you know in tip-top shape so I've got you know new new head gaskets new cam tower gaskets valve cover gaskets and, and all that uh, new timing belts I uh, you know I had to learn the the timing sequence on on the, the Subaru motor it um, you know it's a little different than a you know small block or big block Chevy that I'm used to so or a Volkswagen you know uh, so anyway so we, uh, engines working well uh, I've I used to have a smaller battery and it and it would you know, it start the engine just fine the ballistic uh, eight cell and uh, but I went with a electric pre-rotator so the electric pre-rotator would suck the juice right out of that ballistic uh, way too soon uh, even two ballistics together uh, didn't quite hold up it was it was you know right on the verge of not not working right so I upgraded to this one this this uh, battery tender uh, is I think it's the uh, 480 uh, cranking amps which uh, more than enough it, it works pretty well um, I'm happy with it and it's super lightweight so I've got a fuel tank uh, pretty standard in gyros uh, the, the the seat being the fuel tank this is a rather large one uh, I'm not sure I've never filled it all the way up to see how much it really holds but you know probably 10 12 gallons uh, but you know one day I'll do that and I'm gonna go ahead and and remake the uh, the fuel level placard here and and uh, you know go all the way up to about here probably <clears throat> we've got the cyclic uh, standard air command type cyclic makes everything go left and right forward and back and uh, it works out right very very simple um, you know easy to replace everything uh, we've got the uh, my new dash panel here uh, I used to have a couple of uh, when Let's say when I first got the machine, I had a bunch of old gauges, half of them didn't work. So I replaced them with two uh, MGL gauges. Uh, one was the E2, I'm sorry, the E1, which did all the engine uh, management stuff. And then the Flight 2, which did altitude, airspeed, uh, you know, RPMs, all that stuff. Well, <clears throat> those MGL gauges uh, had to, had to be 
programmed. Uh, you had to have the right sending unit to get the right numbers out of it. And I sort of, I had them pretty much worked out. Everything was, was working except for the rotor tack. I could not get that thing to work right. But uh, all of a sudden the, the Flight 2 gate had 14 hours on these gauges and the Flight 2 just quit. So I sent it back to MGL. MGL decided they didn't want to replace it. So, um, you know, they'd sell me a new one. But after 14 hours and, and it quitting, I'm, you know, I just went ahead and uh, went with all analog gauges. This probably cost me just a hair more than replacing that one gauge. And, and I like uh, the ability of, uh, the ability for me to easily read analog gauges due to they have a, a sweeping gauge. So once you get to learn your machine, it's easy, you know, these gauges just need to be pointing up <laughs> pretty much and everything is, uh, you know, uh, everything seems fine. So um, anyway, I did finally get my rotor tack working a couple weeks ago and uh, it's working okay. As you can see in the video last week, uh, as the rotor tack slowed down, it would it would kind of sweep funny, but you know, that's that's only when it's barely moving and uh, you know, that's not when you really need it. So um, uh, the only thing I don't like, uh, the altimeter I, I have, it it's, not not very good. I mean, from there to there is a thousand feet. You know, that's pretty much my whole flying and you know so I would I'd I'd much rather get a uh get one with an actual, you know, two needles that that show, you know, a hundred feet, you know, around and then a a thousand for the second gauge. So but, you know, that's more money and uh this works just fine for, for what I'm doing. So uh, we'll deal with it. Anyway, uh, down here we have uh, my uh, one of my modifications was putting on Cessna rudder pedals. These are old Cessna rudder pedals with uh, toe brakes. So, and I I went ahead and went with push pull cables, and uh, so this operates just like. Uh, you know, pretty much any standard fixed wing out there with rudder and tow brakes. And uh, I'm, since I'm a, you know, originally a fixed wing pilot, it just made more sense to me. So that that's worked out great. And since I have differential tow brakes, I can go with full floating, I mean, full castering nose wheel. So that's another mod I made when I first started doing crow hops one of the uh one of the mistakes i made when i came down the uh had a little bit of crosswind so my rudder was uh rudder was turned and so was the wheel because it was linked to the uh to the rudder and when i came down the I rolled a little and the nose came down a little early and it shot the nose over and uh kind of gave me a little bit of duck walk and uh, kind of scared the crap out of me, and I thought, you know, I can I can fix that. I can just make a full castering nose wheel. Now, when I say full castering, I mean full castering. And uh, also built in a little suspension into it while I was at it. So I have uh, I have a spring up here, a shaft that goes up with a nut, and and uh, that that you know adjusts that. And then uh, to keep it from shimmying too much, uh, you know, shimmy dampener, I've got, I made this band here. This allows it to compress, but it also grabs around here to keep this from just, you know, freely floating around. Like right now, it feels a little loose, but it's not shimmying, so there's no need to tighten it. Here's my uh, pedo tube, all homemade, just, uh, welded a uh, tube into a uh, aluminum plate with a hole drilled in it and then I bolted it through ran my hose up to the uh, back of the airspeed indicator 
This hook is just to tie down the rotors. Uh, I made a little uh, aluminum flag here. Instead of a string, I thought this looked a little nicer. It's just made out of a Coke can and uh, it, it, a little yaw string, so to speak. And uh, my throttle came from uh, a replacement throttle from uh, one of the ARs. They changed theirs over to the uh, locking brake on the throttle. He had this extra handle. I decided to use it for myself. And uh, here's my uh, rotor brake, which is an over centered spring. Here, let me get a better, closer look here. So that's on and that's off. So you can see how it pulls it, and then as it gets to a certain point, it kind of over centers and it locks itself on. These are my uh, fuel pump uh, switches. Uh, I've got two fuel pumps and both of them being on with the caps closed so there's no, no way they can accidentally be turned off. And to turn them off, you gotta flip the cap and actually flip them up. This is my pre-rotator switch. Low is down off is in the middle and high is up and uh, I'll show you all that when I uh, when I get in and get ready to fly this is a trim adjustment I'm I'm not really too keen on it but it it kind of works for now I'm gonna I'll probably change this up one day anyway it's like an uh, like an industrial throttle cable or throttle lock you could pull it and it locks up and, and, and then you can lock it down wherever you get. You can do some fine adjustments with it. So that allows me to dump all of the trim so that the stick's not, you know, full back when I'm taxiing. So I can just push it forward with a lot less ease. And as you can see, all that, that cable does is pull down on this to, to trim it out. Good. Got a full on cutoff for the battery. Uh, shuts the battery off totally when I'm not using it. Um, uh, I had to make the uh, water tube here. It's very uh, crazy on these uh, Subarus. They, one of the, the the, you know when you, when you convert it you don't have all the original stuff so what happens is the it'll collect air and you'll overheat uh, or not collect air but air will not bleed out of the system unless you have a tall pipe that gets above the full water level of the engine so you can let all the the air bleed out of the system of the cooling system and it's, it's been working great uh, we got, uh, let's see, let's go up here to the mast. Since I uh, put this engine on, it's a lot heavier. I also went with a 25 foot McCutcheon rotor. Uh, these have plenty of lift. And since the, a lot of gyros, they have that issue of hitting the tail when they're full back. You can tell mine don't have that issue. I believe if it did flap, it, it could possibly hit the ground, but you just got to be careful when you're taxiing. Just have the stick forward. It's a big discussion on the rotary forum right now, but I have no problems with it hitting the tail. That's one thing that I, I've done is uh, I took a, an old dominator tail, I chopped about four inches off of it, and uh, I, I love this thing. It, it works out great. Uh, there's my radio antenna. Um, cool thing about the Dominator tail, it has that anti-servo tab. So what that does is, in the even though it's a full floating tail, it's stable because if, if you're off to the side, wind will hit this and just straighten your, your rudder up. And uh, that's, that's great too. With the old Air Command tail, 
I was having to keep my feet on the rudders with pressure the whole time. One or two trips around a pattern, my legs were hurting. So, uh, and yeah, I know I could have probably worked that out with the trim tab and everything, but I, I just didn't like the feel of that, that particular rudder. And um, anyway, uh, here's my uh, fuel pumps. They're uh, two Holly electric centrifugal pumps. I've got, I've got them running in parallel with a check valve above each one. So, and they both run all the time. The odds of both of them dying at the same time are very rare. So one of my pre-flights is I'll turn one on, check it, turn the other one on, check it, and then turn both on to fly. Um, the check valve keeps this one from bleeding back into that one and keeps that one from bleeding back into that one. So there's always pressure going up into the carburetor. So uh, that's, uh, oh, the pre-rotator. Let me show you uh, this thing here. It is just a small block Chevy starter. And uh, you can't get any easier and cheaper than that. Uh, the, the way you get two speeds, so if I just ran it like a normal starter and I didn't have this in here, it would be 12 volts uh, all the time through the, through the rotor. And just starting this rotor out being 25 foot long and rather heavy, uh, that would put a real, real toll on that, that starter. It would draw too many amps and, and you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be very good. So the way we get around that is we stick another starter solenoid right here. And this is just a typical forward starter solenoid from, you know, I don't know, I just pick a random number, 1985 Ford Escort, whatever, and there you go. Anyway, so go uh, a welding rod in between as a large resistor. And when you have it on low, the this is not tripped, so the power to the starter, this, this solenoid will trip making the starter turn, but it has to draw its power through the resistor that we made. And once that gets going, you know, of course it turns slower because it's, it's not getting all the power, all the voltage it needs. And once it gets leveled out on RPMs, which doesn't take, you know, a few seconds, and then uh, I'll, I'll flip it to high. Now when I flip it to high, both this starter and this solenoid both trip at the same time, which will bypass the resistor that we made and run the full 12 voltage straight through up to the starter and it'll spin faster because you know, it's getting its full voltage. So uh, that's about it. Uh, that's this particular machine. Um, We've, uh, we've got other machines over here, and uh, I'll show you a few of them. All right, here's one of the club members, Ron. He owns this uh, ultralight butterfly. It's, uh, it's got a MZ202. Uh, I've heard it run. It uh, sounds pretty good. I haven't seen it fly yet, but I'm sure it does. He, uh, he's been doing a little work on it. He had some, uh, some small health problems he had to take care of, and I think he's back in the game now. So, cool thing about this one is the, other than it being so light, the uh, pre-rotator is a brushless motor and uh, a speed controller. So go back over here to the speed controller. That speed controller for use, like, just like on a RC aircraft. Very large uh, poly uh, lithium polymer battery and a servo tester to control the speed of the pre rotator. That's a pretty cool idea. So, over here we have a Subaru 2.2 liter in an RAF 2000. 
has a stabilator, very large tail. Uh, this one uh, flies, uh, flies okay, I guess. Uh, I haven't flown in it yet, but uh, a few of the other guys have. And um, I believe he put it up for sale recently. Uh, you might want to check on the forums. Uh, I, I think it's on Barnstormers. Uh, very, very nice looking machine. And uh, um, somebody would be happy with it. And uh, we have this uh, dust-filled machine here is a golden butterfly owned by one of our members, Dan. Hadn't flown it in a while, as you could see. Uh, it's, it's for sale also. It's got a 2.5 liter fuel-injected Subaru and uh, a 69-inch warp drive prop with a clutch, as you can see. So uh, we have a John Clark designed machine built by uh, one of our members, Mark. And uh, I think Chauncey was helping him and uh, do some of the stuff. So we've, uh, it's got push-pull cables, differential brakes, um, Subaru EA81 uh, with some, uh, you know, custom uh, intake and uh, big signboard tail, very large tail. Electric pre-rotator. And uh, interesting thing about this one, it uses push-pull cables for the cyclic. As you can see, it comes up. And he's got to readjust some stuff. We did a hang test and move the head back. And uh, so he's got to re, uh, reconfigure the uh, pivot points for the um, cyclic. So anyway, he's got the same, very similar system of mine as the uh, pre-rotator, the large resistor for the low speed. Uh, here we have a dominator tandem with a Yamaha 120 horsepower three cylinder with a hydraulic pre-rotator. Uh, this one is a 70 inch warp drive prop. Uh, this machine uh, got plenty of power to it. Uh, it's owned by one of our members, Mitch. And he flies it on a regular basis. He's uh, right at the end of his training. He should be soloing in it pretty soon. Here we have a gyro B. And uh, he's got the air-cooled uh, Rotex 503, I believe. Uh, this, you could, you could download the plans for free online and build it. It's probably one of the most simple machines you could build other than a Benson. Uh, but um, he flies this thing, um, probably, probably comes out here once a month and stays for the weekend and flies all he can. And uh, he lives up in central Texas. Um, it's a pretty cool machine. It's got an offset cyclic, so you're not reaching over. Uh, it's got a electric pre-rotator uh, motor here that it, it runs 12 volts and 24 volts. So at one time we had two 12 volt batteries ran through some relays that had a switch he could go from 12 to 24, but I think he went just down to 12 for now to uh, simplify the, the wiring. Over here we have a 2.2 liter on an RAF 2000 that has the Sparrowhawk drop keel conversion on it with the Sparrowhawk style tail. And uh, this one flies, uh, it's owned by Chauncey and Danny. And um, just the, the cyclic on it is so heavy. And we're, we're, we're thinking about uh, uh, modifying that with some push-pull cables and get some mechanical advantage out of it. But, but we'll see, that's you know future project. And over here, we've got Chauncey's uh, 
single place machine that I believe he built this with, uh, you know, miscellaneous pieces and uh, a tape measure and some tubing and a drill. And uh, I think it came out great. It's a, it's a good looking machine. And uh, he's, he's uh, Danny's flown it a few times. Chauncey's uh, putted around a few times, but he's he's right on the verge of uh, getting out there and, and flying it. Yeah, you gotta take it slow. You don't wanna rush into flying. That's, that's how people get hurt. So it's an RF2000. It used to be owned by Mike. He sold it to uh, a, a guy uh, that's had some medical issues. He hadn't been out here in a while, but um, he's, you know, you know, eventually he, he might come out and pick it up. But it's got a 2.2 liter. Um, it's been sitting a little while, a little dusty, but other than that, you know, it's a beautiful machine. It's got a very uh, extended tail, you know, pretty, pretty large uh, horizontal and, uh, and that's a pretty cool machine. We got uh, over here tucked away in the corner. We have a old gyro with a Mac on it. It's a Benson, actually, uh, that the couple of the club members picked up for a, for a little side project. This is from uh, Ron's Gyrocopter Sales and Service. Uh, I heard a story that this machine uh, had an engine out and landed in the uh, Atlantic Ocean and got salvaged, put back together, uh, you know, at one time. Um, I, don't, I don't know anything other than that about the story. So, but uh, yeah, this, this'll be, you know, a little rainy day thing, putting, putting things on this. That, I, I don't know if they're gonna try to restore it or stick a different engine rotor on it and, and, and fly, who knows. Turn my Turn battery, battery on. on. Plug in my radio wires. Clear pop. Clear So the wind is favoring uh, runway one, two. Pretty light. Yeah, you see this big uh, stripe on the ground down here. That's hydraulic fluid from when the county finally finished repaving all the taxiways they uh, they came out here with a like a street sweeper and a hydraulic hose busted and then they drove the thing all the way down the taxiway back toward over by the fuel pumps left a big giant trail Better get over here out of the way let my engine warm up. 
All right, let's go. Guys, look clear. I see no traffic. Get my rotor brake off. And here's low on the pre rotator. Let me just bump it in so I don't really. Alright, there we go. Wait for it to get to the, the top of the low speed. And high. A little faster, a little faster. You can see it reading here on the gauge. We're at 100. Get a little throttle. Keep that alternator giving some juice there. And we're about 125. Here we go. Kind of like that experimental guy playing 96 Alpha, taking runway 12 and a whack. Let that uh, rotor screw up before I give it too much throttle. Or 150. I can hear the rotor whisper. The front end getting light. Road 200. There we go. There's the front end. I give it some throttle. And let's go flying.
couple of uh, couple of uh, go rounds on the do a couple of go rounds on the uh, gas runway. This thing wants to climb. back in, let's see if it'll warm up a little bit later. My face is frozen, my hand's frozen, but the hand's being frozen my own damn fault. Should've worn some gloves. Lesson learned.
Alright. All my gauges look good. Traffic looks good. Liberty traffic. We'll stop here and uh, pre rotate. So I'm going to go RPMs. And we got low. Oh, rotor brake. And low. Anyway, traffic turn mode out 296 Alpha, taking runway 12 Anawat. Alright, so we're going to hold stick all the way back. Let that rotor spool up. Starting to hear a little whisper. There's the front end. That means it's wanting to fly, so. Slowly, a little faster.
Final one, two, and a wax. Full stop.